But generally speaking, you pay your own attorney's fees. Okay. How long does it usually take to administer an estate or a trust? Well, that's another good question. Uh, it depends on what kind of estate or trust you have. You've got a business, takes you know, probably at least a year because you got to close the business down or decide whether you want to try to keep it going. If you're going to try to keep it going, how are you going to get it financed? Uh, if it's real estate, uh, you're going to sell it, get it on the market. How long does it take to sell? Um, in the old days, the rule used to be that if the estate was big enough to require an estate tax, since the estate tax wasn't due before nine months after the date of death, and you didn't want to pay it early because during that nine months you get to keep the interest earned on the money. Right. If, if the estate was that big, you, the courts normally assumed you'll take at least nine months to a year to close the estate. But in today's day and age, the estate tax exemption is now $5 million, actually $5,200,000. Mm -hmm. Most estates aren't that big, mm -hmm. so you don't have to file an estate tax return. Mm -hmm. And so it's just pretty much a matter of how long it's going to take to either close down the business or sell the real estate. But it has to be open usually a period of at least in a, in a probate estate, at least a period of four months so the creditors can come in and make their claims. In a trust, there's no necess there, you don't necessarily have to give notice to creditors, but you often do, and so there's at least four months. So usually it's going to take somewhere between six months and a year to a year and a half. Now, that doesn't mean you have to wait the entire year and a half before mm -hmm. you get anything. Mm -hmm. During the period of probate, the executor, if it's a probate estate or an administrator, or if it's a trust, the trustee can make what are called preliminary or partial distributions. He can say, listen, the estate's not ready to close yet because we haven't sold the house, we haven't finished dealing with this creditor, we haven't done this, we haven't done that. Uh, but I can at least distribute a certain amount of money now. And so you can expect to be able to, you can start demanding mm -hmm. at least a partial distribution or a preliminary distribution. Mm -hmm. And usually the trustee is a beneficiary. and. You know, he's got to treat you equally the way, you, the way he treats himself, so he wants the money too. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So usually he's going to facilitate a preliminary or partial distribution. So what happens if somebody gets unhappy and you get litigation? How long can that tie things up? Years. <laughs> I like to say it uh, shouldn't take that long, but frankly it does. And it's a matter I'm afraid of lawyers. You know, you asked you asked me correct. You're right to ask me about lawyers' fees because they're so large right now mm -hmm. that uh, you know you can win the game and lose the lose the war, win mm -hmm. the battle and lose the war because the attorneys' fees can be so high. Right. And uh, there are a lot of lawyers who basically uh, aren't looking at it the same way you would like them to look at it. You want mm -hmm. them to tell you how much you think it are going to cost, and of course they can't predict it. it depends mm -hmm. on how hard the other side fights. Right. But am I going to pay you more than it's going to? That I'm going to win. Right. And I know you can't guarantee how much I'm going to win, but you can at least tell me it's more probable than not that I'll win, mm -hmm. and it's more probable than not that I'll get more money than I'm going to pay you. Mm -hmm. And I think a client's got the right to expect that. But lawyers, a lot of lawyers will say, "Well, you tell me what you want me to do." <laughs> <laughs> and frankly, so long as you can afford to pay me, I'll be right there for you. Oh, boy. And as soon as you can't, they're gone. They're, they're, in other words, they're focusing on what they like to call your burn rate. How much, how much justice can you afford? Okay. Um, what accountings are required for estates and trusts? At the end of the first, well, actually, at the end of the first six months, a trustee uh, can be required to do an accounting. Generally speaking, after one year, you have to do an accounting. So if it's been six months since you got your last accounting, you as a beneficiary you can say to the trustee, give me an accounting. Mm -hmm. And it's a cash basis accounting. It's not a cruel basis. So what it, mm -hmm. is, it, it basically is supposed to say this. This is what was there when the decedent died. Mm -hmm. This is what it consisted of, and this is what it was worth. These are the receipts that have come in, dividends, rents, interest. These are the monies that I've paid out, property taxes, uh, uh, insurance premiums, uh, creditors' claims. This is what has been sold, and this is what's left. And it's all supposed to balance. You're supposed to get that once a year, but you're also entitled to the documents, the financial documents of the estate and trust. In other words, you've got the right to say, look, I don't want to just see your accounting. 
I want to see the deeds to the real estate. I want to see the, the check register. I want to see the check statements, the bank statements, the stock statements. You know, I want to see the rental deposits. And you've got the right to look at those things. Now you can't, well, you, you can try to be a pain on the rear end, and the trustee is not your agent as such, mm -hmm. but he's got a duty to make disclosure to you of those kinds of documents. Mm -hmm. And often you want to see those even more than you want to see the accounting, because it's those documents that tell you the truth. Okay. What suggestions <clears throat> do you have to keep peace in a family of a decedent who had children from multiple marriages or relationships? You can have a whole thing probably on this. <laughs> well, that's, that's probably why so many lawyers these days are doing lawsuits over estates. Yeah. Uh, the, frankly, Mike, they're keeping our bodies alive longer than our minds. And my doctor the other day told me that, well, the reason, Mr. Demery, you're feeling these aches and pains is because their bodies weren't designed to stay alive longer than 55 to 60 years. That was a shock. Yeah. Gee, thanks a lot, <laughs> Doc. And there are a lot of second marriages, a <laughs> lot more than there ever were before. A lot of children by the prior marriage who got used to the fairly lucrative lifestyle we supply to them but are not as interdirected as we are. Mm -hmm. And while they want their freedom at 18, they thoroughly expect us to continue to support them in the style to which they grew accustomed. Mm -hmm. And uh, when uh, you die, they expect to get something. Mm -hmm. Although, frankly, the law is that your property is yours to do with as you please. Mm -hmm. So a combination of those things leads to a lot of lawsuits between the kids from the various marriages, between the second spouse, and uh, it's difficult. Uh, some people think, well, I'll appoint all of the kids as trustees. Oh. That's ridiculous. <laughs> you might have six different kids, and mm -hmm. when you have multiple trustees, the general rule is they all have to agree on everything. Well, yes. I, that'll, that'll hold up administration for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. You can't get these kids to agree on anything, let alone on all the things that have to be done. Mm -hmm. So you normally try to pick somebody who will be the trustee. It doesn't have to be one of the kids. It can be some friend. The amount of money that the trustee makes is usually pretty minimal compared to the headache of, of trying to reconcile the claims of multiple people mm -hmm. and get them to get along. Mm -hmm. But again, the trustee does not have to do what the beneficiaries say. He's got mm -hmm. to follow what the trust and the will says. Right. What can a beneficiary do if he or she suspects that an executor or trustee is mismanaging or stealing from an estate or trust? You demand to look at the financial records right away. I want to come down there. I want to see the bank books. I want to see the check registers. I want to see the bank and brokerage statements. And you go through them. If they don't let you see them or they keep putting you off, you file a petition with the court ordering them to do so. Um, at the same time, you can also file a petition to remove them. And if you think that uh, it's, or if you can prove that there's urgency involved, that he's been sending money off to Switzerland or something like that, you can ask the court to immediately suspend his powers, put somebody neutral in there mm -hmm. to hold on to the money until you can find out what's going on. Mm. So pretty much you've got to get a lawyer for those things. It's pretty hard. You can't really, you can try, but it's very hard to do it on your own. Yeah. But it's also very important to move as quickly as you can. On the one hand, you don't want to create a big stink about something that might be entirely innocent. On the other hand, and this is the key thing to keep in mind, when that, once that money's gone, it's gone. Mm -hmm. You may be able to get a judgment against that trustee or executor to surcharging him. That means making him pay it back. But usually those guys spend that money as fast as they can get it. Mm -hmm. And you might have a million dollar judgment against somebody that's got uh, two pennies to rub together. Yeah. Well, they don't have, you know, it wouldn't do you any, if, even if we had debtor's prison, it doesn't do you any good to put them in there. Uh-huh. Okay. Now, I receive a gift or an inheritance. Is that taxable income that I have to report on my income tax return? The gift or their inheritance, generally speaking, is not. But during that period of probate, remember I told you about that year? Let's say it was a, it was a bank account mm -hmm. with $100,000 on it, and it made $1,000 worth of interest, mm -hmm. or $2,000 worth of interest, or $10,000 worth of interest. I'd like to know where that bank is, but that's another story. <laughs> um, then, you're, then if you get the, you get the 100 plus the 10, you've got to report income, the $10,000 of income, as on your income tax return. But no, the 100000 or the million dollars, that's the principal. You don't have to generally report that as taxable income. Yeah, okay. What about reassessment? If you inherit real estate, what, what 
reassessment concerns do you have? Well, the property is, uh, the, the assessor is, is entitled to reassess it, and you can bet your bottom dollar that with today's day and age, they're looking for everything they can. But if the house is the principal residence, well, excuse me, let me rephrase that. The, uh, the property going to the surviving spouse does not get reassessed. To the extent it's going to the kids, the principal residence, plus uh, $1 million of other real estate is exempt from reassessment. Mm -hmm. So if you're debating whether to sell the house before somebody dies or pass it on to the wife and kids after they die, that's one of the reasons you, you hold on to it, because mm -hmm. uh, the property does not get reassessed for property tax purposes. But anything else gets reassessed up to what the assessed value is as the date of death. Okay. We're really getting close to um, being out of time here. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is stop on the questions and maybe give you a chance to throw out, you know, uh, the wisdom that you have related to uh, beneficiaries uh, of estates and trusts. Well, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> the economy is in a lot, lot of pain right now. Uh -huh. And frankly, we, especially uh, those of us that uh, live in like Santa Clara County, which is one of the wealthier counties around, have spoiled our kids for a long time with a lifestyle that, frankly, they probably can't supply to themselves. It would be good if we've educated them to learn how important it is to be able to support yourself. That it's not so much how much money you make, but how good a life you live that's important. But, you know, life's a struggle. And, um, the children often have economic needs that uh, they didn't have when they were kids, when they were little kids. Now they've got to find the money to, to handle them. The problem is, is that inheritance is only there for months, and you shouldn't really think about living off of it. It's a gift, but it's not the kind of gift that makes that much of a difference. And I will see parents, uh, older folks, agonizing about how to divide up the money. And it kind of amuses me because whether or not that money is going to be of any real significance to them is pretty much down the list of important things. Uh, your, their health is critical. Their marriage is critical. Their kids are critical. Even their job can be critical. But how much money they inherit from their parents is usually of secondary purposes. Now, of course, there are people who are developmentally disabled, children who need extra help, special needs trusts for them. But with that exception, I think that fo people focus too much on taking care of the people after they die, and frankly, I don't think they should. I think they should worry about helping them live as opposed to worrying about what happens to your money after you die. Okay. Mike, we're all out of time, folks. I hope that we've given you some things to think about. I think Mike shares some very valuable information here. We'll see you next time on Financial Insider Weekly. <laughs>